Hello everyone, this is John Basmaji from Western University, and today we'll be taking a closer look at stroke volume determination in the context of an interesting case. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to review the video on stroke volume determination by Dr. Robert Arntfield on the Western Sauna website. It'll be providing you with a lot of background information to understand stroke volume determination and cardiac output calculations, which we're going to explore here further. We came across a patient admitted to the ICU post-arrest secondary to Tursad's to point. Now this was a patient who had returned to spontaneous circulation and after it was in persistent state of shock with an unclear etiology and was on maximum doses of both levofed and vasopressin. Now the patient had an excessive past medical history but what is relevant to us here is that they had known pulmonary hypertension graded to be mild to moderate with expected severity and only mild to moderate dilation on, of the RV and this was on an echo that was done about a month prior to the ad admission. Uh, the patient also had a previous history of cardiac arrest secondary to Tursaz de Point, both instances in the setting of profound hypokalemia and QTC prolongation. Now, the overnight team uh, were able to do a qualitative uh, bedside point of care ultrasound, and the bedside echo there that was done overnight uh, showed a qualitatively reassuring LV function. And given the fact that the patient failed multiple fluid bolus challenges and a CGPA was done to rule out PE, suggested initially that this was probably not a preload problem. Now, the patient, however, was quite bradycardic uh, with a heart rate of 30s to 40s, and this was pinned as the prime suspect for the cause of shock. Here we have a parasternal long axis view and on first look it is quite reassuring. As you can see the inferior and septal walls are thickening quite nicely and they're coming towards the center of the cavity. The mitral valve excursion is also reassuring. As you can see it is opening quite nicely here. You start to get a sense that the RV outflow tract is dilated. Now I did mention that the patient did have a history of pulmonary hypertension but there was an echocardiogram like I said that only said it was mild to moderate in terms of its severity. Here we have a parasternal short axis view of the heart and here as you can see for a patient who has baseline mild to moderate pulmonary hypertension that the fact that the RV is dilated to this degree suggests that there may be an element of acute decompensation with respect to its uh, RV function. Uh, now I did mention that the on-call team did try multiple fluid challenges and they felt that insufficient preload was probably not a major issue uh, in determining this patient's etiology of shock. But keep in mind that excess volume administration can lead to right ventricular obstructive physiology, especially in someone who's got baseline RV dysfunction, uh, which can then cause impairment in the loading conditions of the left ventricle, uh, causing what could be a relative preload problem for the LV. What also confirms what we saw in the parasternal long axis view is that the left ventricle is still quite reassuring. You can see the ventricle is contracting quite nicely. All the walls of the LV are thickening symmetrically at the level of the papillary muscles. And you see that the ejection fraction is actually 70% or more, just based on the fact that the cavity is essentially being obliterated when the walls are contracting. So this builds on the notion that perhaps the patient's shock is actually from RV obstructive physiology. Moving on to the apical four-chamber view of the heart, we see what confirms what we've previously seen and built on the previous images. The RV here is quite enlarged, and it was very difficult to image the free wall of the LV, but we already get a sense that the RV is quite dilated, more, much more actually than what would be expected for the patient's baseline level of mild to moderate dilation and mild to moderate dysfunction. The RV wall here looks quite thick which does go uh, and build on the picture of chronic uh, pulmonary hypertension. And as you can see, the RA is also quite enlarged as well, which also adds to that picture. This is all in keeping with the patient's known history. Now, even looking at the tricuspid valve and eyeballing the tricuspid annual plane systolic excursion, or TAPSI, you can see that the contractions are also not all that reassuring. This is the same apical four-chamber view, but I've cropped the movie so that I can focus on the septum here. And I want you to pay close attention to the actual septum and see that there's abnormal um, septal motion uh, by virtue of RV dysfunction. We decided to get under the hood and calculate the stroke volume. And what we did here is we obtained an apical five-chamber view and isolated the LV outflow tract. And then from that, we were able to apply a pulse wave Doppler and obtain the velocity time integral, which is a well-established surrogate marker of stroke volume. Uh, 
In this patient, it was found to be 11.2 centimeters, which is quite low, keeping in mind that normal valves are about 18 to 20 centimeters or so. You'll also notice that the heart rate was 47, which is also quite low, all of which would be contributing to a decreased cardiac output, which is explaining her degree of shock. Our bedside echo findings raised a lot of interesting questions to the team. Based on the story, we were quite confident that this was not a systemic vascular resistance issue that was causing hypotension. It was an issue of cardiac output. So our first question was, if this was a cardiac output issue, is it a problem with stroke volume or heart rate? Well, the patient's heart rate at the time of the echo was 47, so this can definitely be contributing to the degree of shock. But at the same time, we did calculate stroke volume, which was found to be uh, with a VTI of 11.2 centimeters. The velocity time integral, or VTI, is a good surrogate marker for stroke volume. And keeping in mind that the normal value is about 18 to 20 centimeters, it's very safe to say that stroke volume is very depressed in this patient and definitely contributing to the degree of shock. Given that stroke volume was reduced, our next question was, is this a problem with preload, afterload, or contractility? Well, it wasn't likely to be an afterload issue. There was no known valvular pathology, and the patient was very hypotensive here. Contractility was also reassuring given the fact that all the walls were thickening symmetrically on the views that we just saw, and there was no regional wall motion abnormalities that were evident. In fact, the ejection fraction was probably more than 70%, and although the ejection fraction is reassuring, this does not mean that the stroke volume that is being generated is translating to an adequate cardiac output to sustain the patient. In fact, in this case, quantitative echocardiography was very helpful in highlighting how depressed the stroke volume really was. It was our thought that the physiologic derangement here is actually the acute on chronic dysfunction of the right ventricle. Our echo shows the severity to be really out of keeping with what we expected the patient to have based on the previous echo findings. And with RV obstructive physiology, the loading conditions of the left ventricle are subsequently diminished. And so what ends up happening is that the RV creates a relative left-sided preload problem, uh, which produces low stroke volume. So our third question was whether our agent of choice would favor more inotropy or chronotropy, and we decided on choosing something that would really do both. Our agent of choice here was epinephrine. Now, a lot of you may be wondering as to why we didn't opt for something like milrinone, but keep in mind the patient was very hypotensive and had a declining urine output. Now, although milrinone would preferentially give us some increase in RV function, uh, the afloat reduction that may come after may not be tolerated by the patient. And the fact that the patient's GFR was declining quite rapidly may impair its uh, clearance even more. So therefore, we ended up going with epinephrine, and we titrated it up to 15 micrograms per minute. After starting epinephrine, the patient was reassessed, and we found, in fact, that a lot of the indices of hypoperfusion that manifested originally were actually improving dramatically. The patient had an increasing central venous oxygen saturation, lactate levels started to come down quite nicely, and the urine output really just started to pick up as well. Now, this is a parasternal long-axis view that was done a few hours after the first echo study was done. At this point, epinephrine, like I said, was titrated up to 15 micrograms per minute, and we already were starting to wean off vasopressin and levofed. You can see here that the LV really does not look all that different qualitatively. The contractility is still reassuring with the inferior and septal walls thickening quite nicely and coming in towards the middle of the cavity. And again, the mitral valve excursion is also very reassuring. But what's interesting here is you can already start to see that the RV outflow tract was not as dilated as it was before. And you can really better appreciate that here in the parasternal short axis view on our second look. If you remember before, our initial parasternal short axis view showed an RV that was very dilated, even much bigger than the left ventricle itself. Here we can already see that the right ventricle is contracting a lot better and it's not nearly as dilated and even the LV itself is not as hyperdynamic as it used to be. Now when we put the pre-epinephrine and post-epinephrine view side by side, you can really appreciate the improvement in the right ventricle's function. And here it's quite impressive in terms of how much less dilated the post-epinephrine views actually are and how much better the contraction of the right ventricle actually is. Now when we ended up doing cardiac output analysis and stroke volume calculation, we saw that the cardiac output had dramatically increased with a significant improvement in stroke volume. Our velocity time integral or VTI was before 11.2 centimeters and now it was up to 18.2 centimeters.
Now keep in mind that the heart rate was initially 47 and now it was 51. And although that was a modest increase in heart rate, the main pivotal physiologic factor here in the improvement in cardiac output was actually stroke volume. And the reason for that is because the right ventricles function and right-sided cardiac output really improved dramatically with administration of epinephrine. And as a result, it improved the relative preload of the left ventricle. Like we mentioned before, it was a bit deceiving because heart rate initially was thought to be the main culprit uh, and main contributor for this patient's shock. And this point of care ultrasound study really demonstrates the power of bedside ultrasound in both qualitative but also quantitative assessments as well. And the patient was actually ultimately resuscitated and within 36 hours all the vasoactive agents were weaned off entirely. Thank you everyone for tuning into this screencast. Please be sure to check out our Western Sauna website for more tutorials and videos. Goodbye for now.